Whenever you're ready. Okay, so imagine you are climbing up a 100 foot rock face. You look down, your palms start to get really sweaty, your knees start shaking, your heart starts racing, and you can actually hear your heart beating. And then all of a sudden, you fall. Uh -oh. But the good news is you have a harness on, and you're connected to a belayer down below, and a rope that goes through all the carabiners. So you just pick back up onto the rock, and then you climb all the way to the top. So that was my first experience climbing outdoors. I only fell an inch, but it was the scariest thing of my life. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about, today I'm going to compare four different styles of rock climbing along with a brief history of the sport. So rock climbing has been an essential component to mountaineering for hundreds of years. It wasn't until the 1950s that this, it started to take shape as a sport. Climbers flocked to Yosemite National Valley to climb the most impressive base, rock bases in the world. According to NPR, there were two different kinds of climbers in the 1950s. There were those like Warren Harding that would do anything to get to the top of the rock. That meant hammering bolts anywhere along the rock face. They didn't care about destroying the rock face. They didn't care about the environment. Their goal was to just get straight to the top. And there are those like Royal Robbins, who is more of a purist climber. So they were leave no trace. They cared about the rock face. And they took everything that all the gear that they planted into the rock, they took it all out after they were done with their climbs. Um, in 1987, fast forward 30 years, in 1987, the first indoor rock climbing gym was formed in Seattle, Washington, and it was called Vertical World. And that gym is still up and operating today. Right, so now that we know a little bit about the history of the sport, we're gonna move into our first style of rock climbing called trad, or traditional climbing. So trad climbing, here is, um, I actually brought this in. We have some trad gear. So these are little anchors and these are carabiners. So this is some of the um, equipment that you need for trad climbing. Um, trad climbing has no established routes along the rock face. So it requires a tremendous <coughs> amount of technique and skill. So basically when you go up, you're bringing your rope, you're bringing all of your gear with you and you ha usually have a team behind you. So you have to take these little anchors and securely fasten them in between little pieces of rock that seem sturdy. These trad climbers are really strong and they're really precise. Their goal is not to get to the top, their goal is the journey. When you're a trad climber, you do not want to fall off the rock face because if you do and your anchors are not sturdy, you could potentially fall seven to eight feet below and hurt yourself really bad. Um, so according to REI, up through the old days of the 1980s, <laughs> trad was simply known as climbing. So there is no other kind of climbing besides trad. Okay, trad climbing can only be done on real rock. You can't do that indoors in a rock climbing gym. Now moving on to our second style of climbing, which is called sport climbing. There are two different kinds of sport climbing. You can break it down into two different categories. Okay, so sport climbing has these fixed anchors or fixed bolts that are bolted <coughs> into the rock. So this changed rock climbing people. It made it way more accessible. Um, according to REI, sport climbing involves high intensity climbing on relatively short routes. Its distinguished characteristics include pre-placed pre bolts like that um, and an emphasis on the physical aspect of the sport rather than the destination or the summit. So you can actually climb really fast up these routes. Um, and to break down those two categories, first is top rope. So top rope is when somebody has already climbed up the route and they create, there's an anchor, they bring the rope through, they repel down. It's pretty much the safest way to climb. You have a belayer down below and you hook into um, the rope with a figure eight and a protective knot and you just start climbing. So the belayer down below takes the rope. So if you really can't fall very far because if you fall, it's gonna be an inch or two. They always have you secure, secure on the rope. Um, as opposed to lead climbing, the lead climber has to take the rope up with them. So they have to have a lot more technical skill when they're climbing. Um, 
they're taking the rope up with them and they're using these carabiners and as they go, the belayer down below is actually feeding the rope instead of taking the rope. Um, they hook into the wall just like this. So it does require more skill and than top rope does. It is a little bit more dangerous. Okay, moving on to our next kind of type of climbing, we're gonna move into um, bouldering. So bouldering is often confused with soloing. The difference between bouldering is that the bouldering routes or problems, as they call them, are a lot shorter. So they're anywhere from 10 to 30 feet. Now, if solo soloing is anywhere from like 100 to 3,000 feet. Um, bouldering has routes that are commonly referred to as problems. There's me bouldering, and you can see that it's not very high, but it still requires a lot of strength and te technique to um, get up to the top. So there's no gear in bouldering at all. So you've dropped all the gear except for your climbing shoes and there's a crash pad below. Usually you have people spotting you so that they can break your fall and that you fall onto the crash pad and hopefully you don't get hurt. So this is where we've lost all our gear. There's a lot more strength required and you need a little bit more skill. It's definitely more dangerous. Has anybody ever seen or heard of the movie uh, Free Solo? Okay. So free solo is free soloing is the most dangerous. <coughs> Alex Honnold is the most dangerous type of climbing, and very few attempt free soloing. Um, on June 3rd, 2017, Alex Honnold became the first person to solo El Cap, which is a 3,000 foot vertical wall in Yosemite National Valley. Now some people think he's totally crazy for what he did, but according to National Geographic magazine, Alex Honnold free soloed the free rider route on El Cap, Yosemite's 3,000 foot southwest face. He completed the route in less than four hours. Honnold spent a year choreographing thousands of precise moves to get through a gauntlet of physical and nerve testing challenges. And according to Free Solo, the movie, when he was discussing or when he was talking about this, doing this climb, he actually spent eight years perfecting each part of this climb. He would go up with other climbers on a rope and he would he would just perfect each and every move so that he was completely ready for his climb. So now that we've discussed a little bit about the history of rock climbing and the four different styles of rock climbing, it's best to start climbing and practicing in a gym. It's the safest way. Um, and maybe one day I will see you at a gym or on the real rock outdoors. Thank you. Cadence, what did you think? I thought it was really good. It was difficult for me to find things to improve. But the strong points, um, I thought the introduction was phenomenal and it was really easy to visualize. Uh, there were a lot of references and citations and they were very evenly put throughout. Um, and all the visuals were easy to see and well explained, which I also thought helped you know, bring people that don't really know a lot about rock climbing, help them understand a little bit better. Um, <coughs> and really nitpicking things to improve uh, the transitions, them being explained, I felt made them a little bit less smooth. Yeah. Um, and I feel like it could have been rehearsed a little bit more because it seems like a lot of it was from experience instead of from rehearsing, like it took more time for you to think, um, or a lot of it was just read off the cards. But I thought it went really well. Thank you. All right. They liked your evaluation. I guess so. Um, um, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with everything Caden said. I thought it went really well. Uh, 
just a couple of minor things, and they were, they weren't even that significant. I think the preview is a little bit more ambiguous than you want it to be. You might want to tell us what the four different styles are in the preview. You just say, I'm going to talk about these four different styles and kind of give us some sense of where you're going. The transitions, that was another thing that I kind of picked out. I think they could be a little bit smoother. It's not that they were unclear. It's just sometimes they weren't as graceful as they might have been. Um, Otherwise, I thought everything else was really solid. I, I consistently heard information being presented in the speech. The source citations were good. Uh, the visuals, I thought, were integrated in the speech quite well, although I was anticipating it coming a little bit earlier. It showed up when you were talking about it, which was perfectly fine. Um, and the first question that popped in my mind when, when you were talking was, were you more nervous about giving the speech than you were climbing rocks? Because it seemed like that's the, I mean, that whole opening description that you went through you know, you seem like, oh, that's a piece of cake, and here you are sweating about giving your speech, and that just, just seemed like an odd juxtaposition of situations there. Yeah. All right, thank you.